So, I spent, uh, I spent the morning, yesterday morning, over at the uh, National Cemetery. And uh, the Boy Scouts descended upon the place, swarming everywhere. Uh, look that. By the way, thanks for your help up there today, Matt. It's up there with Tony. Well, it doesn't like that first uh, and, slide. Uh, I should have a picture of my grandson up there. So, again. Doesn't like that slide. That's not your grandson. It's going to be on that first slide. So, Memorial Day used to be called Decoration Day. You know that? It actually goes back to the Civil War. Uh, but Somewhere along the way, somebody said, you know what, yeah, we decorate the grave, but let's call it Memorial Day, we change. Uh, so, I actually had one to have poppies for you guys to put on to the field, but we decorate the grave with poppies. Uh, but, if you ever have confusion with that, Memorial Day is remembering those who have served our country who have passed on. We go through the grave sites and we honor the graves, but better days for those that are living, remember them. Uh, but, my grandson, Ethan, was there with his friend Jackson. Can't get him. Keep going, it's not going to happen. Can we advance that? The next oh. slide? Sure. It won't come up, Joe. Only the background is okay, coming up. What's next after that? That one comes okay. up. Okay. <laughs> All right, so these are some faces you'll probably recognize. This is about 25 years ago. Change is uh, happening, whether we want it or not. Some of the people here you will recognize, some you might not. Look at it again. Go again. Nickel? Go again. Again, please. One more time. Here we go. Some people have gotten married who were single, others who were. These are the people who are still here. Uh, but things have changed because you're not going to stop change. Change is going to happen. So today I want to talk about the fact that we really shouldn't be afraid of that. So the title today, the message today is called Fear Not. Fear Not. And it's going to be from Isaiah chapter 41. If you'll want to use your Bible, so you look up Isaiah 41, verses 18 through 8 through 13. And this will be taken from the um, message that you use. One more minute to start again. Holy One. Every segment required you to use your own language to meet you right now, Lord, to take control of this time. To bless and learn what we ask in Jesus' name. So, Isaiah is one of my closest friends. So he has come to be very personal with me. Uh, have you discovered it? Today, as you read through this text, I want you to insert your name where it mentions Israel, or Jacob, or you. This promise is for you. So I'm going to read through it. As we're reading through, you insert your name in this file. Verse 8 reads, But you, Israel, are my servant. You, Jacob, my first choice, descendant of my good friend Abraham. You're my servant, serving on my side. I have picked you. I haven't dropped you. Don't panic. I'm with you. There's no need to fear, for I'm your God. I'll give you strength. I'll help you. I'll hold you steady, keep a firm grip on you, count on it. Every one who had it in for you will end up out in the cold, real losers. Those who worked against you will end up empty-handed, nothing to show for their lives. When you go out looking for your old adversaries, you won't find them. Not a trace of your old enemies, not even a memory. That's right, because I, your God, have a firm grip on you, and I'm not letting go. I'm telling you, don't panic. I'm right here to help you. Now Isaiah recorded these words to the nation when they were surrounded by their enemies on every side. Things looked about as bleak as they could be. Have you ever felt like that? Like you were surrounded? In 2010, 33 Chilean miners were trapped beneath 2,000 feet of solid rock. When the main tunnel of the mine collapsed, sealing off their exit, they went into survival mode, which included two spoonfuls of tuna, a sip of milk, and a morsel of peaches every other day for two full months. They prayed for someone to save them. On the surface, a team of experts worked around the clock, formulating a, team, a plan to save them. There was no guarantee of success. No one had ever been trapped on the ground 
this long, till the teletop. On October 13, 2010, the men began to emerge, slapping high fives and leading victory chants. A great grandfather, a 40 year old who was planning to get a wedding to be wedded, a 90 year old, all with different stories, but all had made the same decision. They trusted someone else to save them. All of them knew they could not get out of there on their own. No one said, just give me a drill and I'll get myself out of here. They stared the tomb, that stone tomb, long enough to reach the unanimous decision, we need help. Someone to pull us out of here. When the rescue capsule came, they climbed in. God wants a closer relationship with you. He wants to be at your side. He wants you to know he's there. He wants you to realize that he's there to help you. The question is, what do you want? Last Monday morning, this past Monday morning, I had an amazing time of prayer with God. I, I was just absolutely blessed by his presence. And as I was praying, I felt God inspire me to speak and share some thoughts with you. So these are some of them that I'm going to share with you now. First of all, the number one thought was we need to work together as a body of believers, not against each other. Second, God's desire for our church is that we set aside our own personal preferences, as strong as they might be, as different as they might be, and move forward. Third, to look beyond our own ideas, what we think should be, <coughs> and move in the direction that God has for us. Now, how do we know what that direction is? The only way to find that is through prayer. God will help us. God will direct us. God will instruct us. We need to have that through prayer. As a young pastor, many years ago, in my, my uh, early 30s, I had an early morning dream. I woke up from this dream, and it was the kind of dream that you wonder about what it means, but at the same time you know it's something that it's just, you need to hold on to, you need to kind of try and figure it out. And in this dream, I had a person who was kind of like hammering me and asking me questions and kind of pounding me, saying, who are you really? Who are you really? And the answer that came to me was, I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now, I, I didn't know what that meant exactly, but I knew who had said it was the words of John the Baptist. Make way, make straight the way of the Lord. So I, I awoke from that day thinking, boy, I, I need to remember this, and I never have forgotten it. It's always been on my mind and heart. And I, I want to ask you today, have you ever wondered, because I was thinking about this this week, have you ever wondered why God sent John the Baptist? I mean, why did he send the head of Jesus? Did Jesus really need an introduction? Did he need an opening act? This is the Son of God. So here, here are some reasons that God, some reasons that God sent John first. John was prophesied hundreds of years before time. I'm sending my messenger before him, before the Messiah. And when God makes a presence, a promise, he always keeps that promise. Second, John is the last prophet of the Old Testament. Luke says about all of the prophets and the law were fulfilled coming to John. John is the last link to the Old Testament. God needed someone, a voice, to usher in the new covenant, the changes that were about to take place, that the Son of God was coming, the Messiah was there, and things were going to be different. We were about to see something that they had never seen before. And John was that traditional voice. He was that transitional voice Make straight the way of the Lord. Get ready because God's about to do something new. I baptize him in water, but boy, God is about to send someone who's going to do a lot more than that. Baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. Last week, my brother Vinny was here with his family. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I certainly did. And he was here to lead worship, and uh, I, he was here in the morning, and then in the evening, I went to his church because his son, Jonathan, the guy who was the youngest son of the drummer, the drum back here, he was the one that was being baptized at their church in Harvard that night. And there were about 14 people besides Jonathan, 15 people in all who were being baptized that evening. And they had all different ages. Some of them were as early as uh, 
10. One was not quite 10 years of old, he may have age, and others all the way up into their 40s and 50s. They weren't asked to, to write anything down. Lots of times in the past we've actually written things down, have people read, write their testimony down. But they just were asked a question, and from their heart they answered it. What does Jesus mean to you? What has Christ done in your life? And the answers were short, from the heart, and powerful. And the kid who was not yet 10 years old really, really caught me. What has Jesus done for you? What does Jesus mean in your life? And the child said, he has changed everything. He's changed everything. God sent John the Baptist to prepare the people for the road that they were about to walk on. Something new. A new way to go. And I believe that's what God wants to do here among us. Here in Pashar. One of the problems we have, I know I have, and you probably do too, is that we're tied up with these different apprehensions, these fears about what change could mean. We have these trepidations. In the meantime, and I know it's happening to you because it's happening to me, in the meantime, we are also being bombarded with all kinds of different things in your own personal life. Sometimes things get so heavy and so hard and so difficult that all you feel like you can do is just hold on. And you hold on so tight because you're afraid that if you let go, you're not sure what could happen. You might lose what little control that you have. And because of the issues we deal with in our own lives, the problems that come against our life, the culture that's changing around us, the last thing we want to see change is the culture that we know here, the place that we know here. And so we have this, we have this struggle that we go through. <coughs> Pastor, author John C. Maxwell, who has written many Christian books, was uh, pretty well known, writes, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. I want to look at Mark chapter 10. Reading from verses 17 through 22 again through the message. Mark chapter 10. And oh, by the way, it's up on the announcements. John Snow Lett will be leading a Bible study on the book of Mark starting on June 5th. That's a Wednesday coming up. One after this. Mark chapter 10 is a story that you will recognize. Some Bible calling the rich young ruler where a young man came running to Jesus. So verse 17 reads, he went out to the street, as Jesus did, went out to the street, a man came running after him, greeted him with great reverence, and asked, teacher, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, honor your father and mother. He said, teacher, I have from my youth kept them all. You've got to get a little sense there of a little bit of pride, right? He's proud. From my youth, I have kept them all. And Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him and said, there's one thing left. One thing left. Go and sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. And come and follow me. 22 reads, the man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear. And he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. And Mark tells us that Jesus looked at the way the virgin looked at the message. Jesus looked in, in the eye, hard in the eye, looked straight in the eye. And Jesus immediately summed up, knew immediately what this guy was about. It also says in the version that he loved him. He looked him in the eye and he loved him. He knew his situation. He knew that even though he said that he had kept all these commandments from his youth, he really hadn't. Because when he was asked to let go of the thing that was holding him, the binding him, the thing he did not expect to hear, he couldn't do it. He couldn't let go. And he walked away sorrowing. Jesus looks at every one of us the same way in the eye. He sizes up what our situation is. And at times he won't even tell us what the situation is. He waits for us to ask the question. 
This young man was probably watching and observing, looking for Jesus, checking to see what he was doing. He was watching his movements, and he waited for the opportune moment. And when the opportune moment came, he ran out to approach him, and he was respectful. He bowed, he was a good teacher. All, everything was done properly with etiquette. I picture this guy probably in his mid-twenties. He's successful. And at his age, he's got just about everything a person could want. And yet he knows there's something missing. There's something missing. He's got the wealth. He's got the power, the influence at a very early age. And yet there's something missing. And so he knows this person, this Messiah that they're talking about, this Jesus, must know what that one thing is. And so he addressed a good teacher. But the answer that he got back was not what he was expecting. There are times we ask God for things. We're asking for him to do some great things. I think you're praying. I hope you're praying about this because the only way forward is through prayer. But we are not always prepared. And most of the time, we are not prepared for the answer that we get. And we don't want to walk away like this person did, having his head down. Discouraged. Even the disciples were taken back by this because the idea and the teaching of that time, even though these guys were hanging out with Jesus on a daily basis, these 12 guys, the teaching of that day, the prevailing teaching was, the religious teachers was, that if you are obeying God, there will be success in your life and you will show outward signs of wealth. We know that isn't really the case, is it? Some of the most blessed people in the world do not have a lot. They are blessed by God. Some of the people who are the wealthiest have absolutely nothing. But the disciples kind of missed what Jesus' point was here. It wasn't the wealth. It was what was occupying him, what, what commanded him, what possessed him. And oh, by the way, in case you're not realizing it, you and I have an awful lot in common with this guy, this rich young ruler. Maybe not wealth wise. But what we're holding on to, whatever is holding in your life, whatever you're holding on to, you can't let go. He said he was keeping the commandments from his youth, but he wasn't. Because the very first commandment is what? You shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, soul, and mind. Right? Jesus said, the last part, mind. The very fact that he couldn't give it up was evidence that he wasn't. And he went away sorrowing because he couldn't let go. Imagine for a moment, think for a moment, if this story went differently. What if he had given it up? What if he had done it? How his life would have changed? He wouldn't have been just a footnote in the story. But he couldn't let it go. He had a burning passion to find the missing element. But he didn't have the compassion he needed to help the people who were benefited by what he gave away. Passion, compassion. You know, passion and compassion are interesting because they are similar. Passion is intense enthusiasm, barely controllable emotion. That's one definition goes from the dictionary. Barely controllable emotion. It was years ago there was a, a battle cry. Uh, actually, the early part of uh, 2000, 2010, perhaps. And it went something like this. No man left behind. Remember that statement by the military? We leave no man behind. And I thought that was a really original, unique way of looking at that. But I remember all of a sudden that that wasn't so unique. Actually, I thought Alexander Dumas, the writer of The Three Musketeers. How many have read any of his books? The Three Musketeers. How many know The Three Musketeers? OK. Alexander Dumas, who wrote about those guys, had that cry beat earlier on. One for all and oh, yeah, so there's really nothing new under the sun, right? Passion and compassion come from the same root. But compassion, on the other hand, is actually concerned about or having sympathy and concern for the misfortune of others. When you take compassion away from passion, you can have problems. Passion is powerful because it motivates people. It helps them to do things they might never have done. They can climb higher, they can run faster, they can do things that maybe they weren't believing they could do. But that passion takes them there. And passion can sometimes carry other people along with it, inspires them. 
We are looking for passion in our leaders. We want it. We desire it. We want to see that our leaders have passion and that they step up. We also want to make sure that they have not only passion, but they also have integrity. Because those two things must go together. Passion is contagious. About three months ago, I had a visit to, I took a visit, made an appointment to go see my orthopedic doctor. I had all kinds of problems with my left shoulder. Boy, old age is tough, you know. So, for about a year, I'm having trouble. I couldn't open go overhead swim. I couldn't do a lot of things with my left shoulder. It was really giving me a problem. So finally, I broke down and said, let me go visit this doctor. I'm not going to tell you his name. You'll know why. When I go into the office, sit down with him, I've never seen this man before, the first time I've ever met this guy. He says to me, okay, yeah, okay, you know what? Uh, well, you know what we'll do? We'll give you an injection. You know the cortisone shot? Right. We're going to give you an injection in the shoulder. We're going to do that. But if we need it more, if we need it more than once, we'll do it twice. It's going to really help you a lot. And I, I looked at him and said, you know, I'm not so sure I want to do that. He goes, why not? I said, because I'm taking a number of other medications at this point in time, and I'm not sure if I should mix those together. That was the wrong thing to say. He looked at me and said, well, what do you need? What do you take? So I mentioned a couple of things that my uh, cardiologist was having me take. And then he looked at me. And that was it. He got up in my face. And he said to me, look at you. You're dying. <laughs> look at the stuff you're taking. You're di Put this into your body. You're dying. Look at that gut you got there. And he went on. And I'm all like, is this guy for real? And he went on. But you know what? what? And by the way, that was three months and about 10 pounds. <laughs> So as much as I despised that man at that moment, he told me, he gave me the facts, he gave me statistics, he said, here's a book, read it, try and do this with this, try and do that, he said, and come back and see me. I'm thinking, yeah, right, I'm going to come back and see you. But because of his passion, I got the book, and I started to read, and it was a diet change. It was actually not so much a diet, it was just eating differently. And I started to sleep better at night, I started to feel better. And I eventually went back to see him again. And I made sure I made an appointment with somebody else, not him in the office. Passion is powerful, but when passion stands by itself, when passion is along without anything else, it can become twisted and perverted. For example, terrorists. They are very passionate about their cause. But they kill innocents in the process. No one was more passionate than the Pharisees. They were passionate about keeping the law. It was their job to enforce the law. They were going to keep the law themselves right down to the umpteenth degree. And they were going to make sure that everybody else did the same thing around them. They had great power in Israel at that time. Or the Sanhedrin. And so these people who were passionate about the law Grab a woman who is, and they were, again, camping out to be able to know what's going on here. Grab a woman who was at her, in the actual act of adultery. Rip this poor thing out of the bedroom, probably half naked, and they drag her out into a public forum in front of Jesus to try and embarrass him and certainly embarrass her. And they put the question to him, asking for a public judgment call. This woman's caught right in the act. You say about love and forgiveness, this is the law. What do you say we should do? They, caught, they cared nothing about really the law, and they cared nothing about the woman. All they wanted to do was trap Jesus. They were passionate. And you know the story of John 8, right? Jesus knelt down as though he was ignoring them and began to write in the sand with his finger. We don't know what he was writing, I have a guess. We don't know what he was writing. But he looked up at them and said, okay, sure, you want to do it? Go right ahead. The one without sin, you can throw the first stone. You cast the first stone. And then one by one, they all disappeared. Because though they were passionate, they were completely wrong. There is a sign that's posted. There are all kinds of things in New York City posted in Manhattan. But there's a sign posted that said, don't trip over what's behind you. Think about that. It's kind of hard to do that, right? You passed it already. How can you trip over what's behind you? But you can. Depending upon where your focus is, especially if you're looking behind you instead of looking forward. 
My family has been through a very difficult time, a really difficult season of change. Uh, pain and heartache has descended upon one of my daughters like I never thought was possible. And when you love your children, that pain and, and sorrow and that suffering that they feel, you feel it right there with them. This past week was an absolutely hellish type of week. The last two weeks have been terrible, but this one was, it got to the point where you think, I can't get any worse than this. And there was one moment in time where I felt, you know, when that, that feeling of despair begins to creep in. Have you ever felt that? When you ask yourself, how in the world am I going to survive this? How are we going to get through this? But the wonderful thing about being a believer, the wonderful thing about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, not a religious experience, a relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's what he wants with us. He doesn't want that distant relationship. He wants that close relationship. That relationship, that thing we call faith, which is built not just on dumb trust, but built upon experience, built upon life experience. Your walk with him, this gradual day-by-day -day process where he is building you. You're getting ripped down. You're getting pushed around. But every time that happens, you get built up again a little further. And although I had that feeling of, for that moment of, honestly, I didn't know what we were going to do. I didn't know how we were going to survive this. That voice of the Spirit says to me, trust me. I've been faithful before. I'll be faithful again. Trust me. And once again, I had to learn how to let go. I thought I was trusting God. I thought I was putting things in His hands. But Jen and I both had to let our grasp go of the situation. We could not control that situation. No matter how hard we tried, it was going from bad to worse. So finally I said, Lord, I take my hands off of this. I put this back in your hands, Lord. You have to direct this. You have to guide this. And when I did that, without me doing anything else, without me messing up anything else, because I would be trying as hard as I was trying, Things started to change. Without me doing anything else except praying and trusting, the Lord stepped in. We knew we needed help. And He taught us how to trust and let go all over again. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 reads If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are blessed. Boy, that is wisdom, isn't it? I'm going to read that again. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are blessed. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. Help us to let go. Amen. Help us to see you. Help us to seek your direction. Help us to find your way. So what about you? What are you holding on to tightly? Maybe you haven't even thought about this. Maybe you haven't even realized. But there are times we are just it's so involved. I, years ago when I was in the doctor's office, I was under tremendous, tremendous, tremendous stress. Tremendous stress. We were uh, pastoring a church full time, myself and Jen. I was working full time as a teacher at the same time. I was attending graduate school for courses at night. We were building an extension on our house. We were raising three children, going down the list on and on. And when I sat in the doctor's office, he said to me, are, are you under a lot of stress? I said, no. <laughs> because it gets to be so common that you don't even realize it's there. And he looked at me and almost laughed. What are you holding on to today as tight, so tight? What are you afraid of that might get away if you loosen your grip? What is it that God wants you to let go of today? He wants to guide us through these deep orders. He wants to guide you, your life, through whatever you are going through. Before we close today, I want to make sure you have the opportunity for whatever you need prayer with, help with, we can pray with you today. 
But if there's someone here today who had the same opportunity, that young man, that successful businessman, who went to Jesus seeking the one thing he was missing, he didn't know what it was. But when he was told, let go of these things and follow me, he walked away, unfortunately, broken. You don't have to make that same decision. And I don't know if there's anybody here who's in this situation, but, but if you have never heard this gospel before, that Christ Jesus can change your life, and today is your opportunity. So just for a moment, let me bow my head with you. Bow head close, close eyes for a If you're in deep water, you feel like you, it's just about over your head, and you don't know what to do, here's what you do. You need to trust God. You need to ask for His help. You don't need to leave today the same way you walk in this place. You can change everything because it won't be you only doing it anymore. It will be God working with you, through you, changing you, and giving you new opportunity. So if anyone is out there, here's what the Lord asks you to do. Here's what He instructs you to do. Let go of what you're holding on to. Give your life to Him. You don't have to say it in any special word, but here are some words. If you want to, pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I don't know you like I need to, but today I want to. Today I want to give my life to you. Today I want to give my heart to you. Today I want to change what I'm doing. I want to have what I'm missing, and I know you can provide that. Today, I give you my heart. I surrender you to you, my heart. I surrender to you, my life. In Jesus' name. Now, if there's anyone else here today that needs to have prayer about anything, if there's something that's really troubling you, if you need to touch your body, any of that, we're going to close in, in a song here in a moment, and then after that, going to be up here ready to pray with you, so after then, you come. Someone to pray with, maybe grab that person. It can be Pastor John, myself, or Nick. 
That's connected. Or just the sister or brother you've grown in close, close relationship with. But if you need to do that today, take advantage of that time before you go down and, and fellowship and have hope. Your heart and lead me in your 